Let's make, I wanted to announce that the gate of trust that we've learned a couple of times actually just came out while I was away a couple of weeks ago, came out in Spanish. So I'll put, I'll send you guys the link, whoever wants to get it in Spanish or has a friend. Um, I'm actually going to start a class in Spanish, which I've been asked to do many, many times. I'm going to finally do it. Um, I'll keep you guys posted in case you have a friend who might want to join. Let me put actually a link to it also in the chat. You can get it at quejot, um, at quejot.com. You can also get it on Amazon. I see here one second. Yeah, you can also get it. Um, I'll put both links. Well, I'll put this one now and then I'll send in the email also. Um, where's my chat? One second. And, and I'll keep you guys posted in case you have a friend, uh, who wants to take the class in Spanish or you want to gift it to a friend who is more fluent in Spanish and it'll be easier for them to read it. Um, it could make a really, really nice gift. Again, they made it in Spanish, Portal de Confianza. It's ready to go. Okay. So meanwhile, we are not learning straight from the gate of trust. Those of you who are new, maybe Samantha, maybe I see somebody with last name Cohen. Uh, but I don't think you're new in our class, new-ish, but not new. Hey, Tavia. Um, so if you're new to our class, um, we are not learning right this very second from the Gate of Trust directly, which I just said, I made an announcement that they now published it in Spanish. For those of you who have a friend who speaks Spanish, I want to get it, or I'm going to start a class also teaching it in Spanish. I'll keep you posted if you want to let know a friend. But we're not letting, learning from the Gate of Trust directly. We're actually um, learning from a, the, uh, a book by Rabbi Sutton, a Daily Dose of Pasukim Abitachon, very, very lovely book. And we try to bring back the principles to the principles that we learned in the foundational text, the Gate of Trust. Um, but we soon enough, we can start the Gate of Trust again, um, and we or we can start any of the other books that we've done on Bitachon, like the Beis HaLevi, et cetera. So what I want to do today, oh, Fortuna's here. What I want to do today is I want to jump into... Uh, chapter for those of you who have the book and want to follow inside. I want to start with chapter 43 in uh, Rabbi Sutton's book. Let me turn to that page. Chapter 43. Oh, and remind me to share with you again, a funny story. Um, again, all the stories of our lives are very important to share at the end of the classroom. Let me to share with you a little bit anecdote that applies to Bitachon. Um, when I was away planning for my trip that I was away. Um, okay, so chapter 43, for those of you in reading inside, he calls it Grace Emuna, and he's going to discuss a pasuk in Tehillim, a verse in Tehillim that says, um, trust in Hashem and do good, dwell in the land and nourish yourself with faithfulness. It's a pretty common past verse. People know it and say it. Um, you might be familiar with it. And what he talks about here is that very often the fruits of our labors are long time coming, right? If you, you know, sometimes someone is supposed to pay us and it doesn't come through on time. We can become very angry. We can become very despondent. I know it's happened. Um, and those of you who are in business, it often happens. Sometimes it you don't see the money for years. I had a story of a friend who gave a tzedakah for a project and Years went by and that project never came to never came to fruition. And it was, um, I think, a decade and a half later, 15 years later, suddenly something had changed and the project came to fruition and they called them up and they said, you know, what is the dedication that you want or whatever it is? And it was an astonishing project. And he he always wondered, like, what happened to that Sadaka money? What happened? And he says, now I wouldn't be able to afford it. Like 15 years ago, that amount of what that amount of money would be today, I probably wouldn't be able to give that money. And see, you, I thought I had lost that money, but in fact, it was well worth it and whatever. So very that's that's a beautiful outcome. But sometimes in business, we don't even see the, the money or we see it many years down the line or we're waiting for whatever the salvation is, whatever the solution to the problem is. And we're waiting and we're waiting and we become angry, we become this despondent. And for example, if we're trying to sell something and we're not finding the buyer, we become frustrated, etc. And at the bottom of the anger and the frustration is this grievance against Hashem. It's like we have this claim against Hashem, like I'm doing my best to do this, to make a living, to do whatever it is I need to do. Why are all these obstacles? And by the way, a couple um, 
I'll, I'm, I'll mention it now, although I was going to mention it later. I was going to bring it to my desk, but I left it. It's in one of my kids' rooms. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned in my newsletter a book that I think really is very helpful with this issue that he's discussing here, with this issue of becoming angry and despondent and frustrated with what is at this moment, with the waiting and staying in the present moment. And it's by Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Gersht. And it's called, um, It's All the Same to Me. And I found it a very, very helpful little book. I'll put again the link in um, in the in the replay email. It's all the same to, to me. And I'm going to have them on the podcast pretty soon. Um, and I think it really helps us stay, again, everything that we learn about Bitachon helps us stay in this present state of mind. But I think it's a common issue of resisting what is. And he really helps a person um, get into that zone of just understanding that what is, is exactly what needs to be. And how do we know? He says, because it is, right? Because if it wasn't happening, then it wouldn't be exactly what's best for me and what needs to be in my life, right? So all to say that very often we, the struggle is the resisting what is, the frustration, the despondency that comes with just, just resisting what is at this moment. In this verse, David Amelach teaches us how to respond to these the situations with Bitzachon. And he brings a mashal that, and Rabbi Satan brings a mashal that is brought down in the Midrash to explain. And this mashal, this analogy is the following. He says that two men were hired by a king, but their terms of employment were different, right? Two different workers, two different terms of employment. One was hired to complete a certain job, while the other was hired as a day laborer who received his pay at the end of the, the, the day. Okay, so one, one was hired to complete a certain job, right? Like a certain project. And after that job or project was finished, then they were going to get paid. And the other was just a day laborer. At the end of the day, he's going to get his pay for whatever hours he put in that day. So the first worker could have become upset at seeing, right? The first worker is the one who's who's been tasked with the big with the project, whatever the project is. He could come become upset at seeing that the day laborer is going to get his wages, is paid at the end of the day. However, he doesn't. Why? Because he knows ultimately his wages are going to be paid. It's just a different type of employment. It's different timing, okay? So the Midrash says that David Melech sees himself as the first man, as a person who he's not going to be paid exactly at the end of the day. He's been hired for the whole, for the project. He worked, why? David Melech worked very hard for Hashem all his life, and yet he did not get to see the result of his hard work quote unquote, meaning David Amalekh didn't see the building of the base of Megdash. He did lay everything out. He did set the foundation, sort of speak, for the temple to be built, but he didn't build it. His son Shlomo was the one who had the merit to build it. He did not marry to build the base of Megdash, nor to reign in peace. It was only Shlomo who was able to not only just build the base of Megdash, but to have this kingdom of peace and prosperity um, for, for the Jewish people. Nevertheless, he continued to rely on Hashem. Right, we know from David Amalekh, and this is exactly what we're learning in this book. All of these pasukim, there are going to be others throughout the book, but up till now, we've just dealt with um, verses from from David's um, Psalms to Hillam. Right, are all on reliance on Hashem. He didn't feel that he was lacking anything because he, why? Because he nourished himself on Emuna. So let's go back to the pasuk. The pasuk says the verse says. Um, trust in Hashem and do good, dwell in the land and nourish yourself with emuna, with faithfulness, with faith. Okay, so that's that. He was nourished in his emuna. He knows that everything's exactly the way it has to be. Everything is good. Everything is obviously from Hashem. Therefore, it is good. Therefore, it is exactly what it has to be. Now, Rabbi Satan continues further and he says that we shouldn't take out our calculator. So, what is this about? He says that the Rambam gives two other insights to this verse. The first is to trust in Hashem to work out the details when you undertake anything L'Shem Shemaim, right? How many times do we undertake a project? And we're doing it, we know it's completely L'Shem Shemaim. We know it's for, for God's sake. It's in the name of heaven. We're not, 
we we don't know exactly how this is going to play out it almost doesn't make sense it's almost like people would would mock us for for the fact that we are you know keeping kosher or going out on a limb to give somebody a loan or give a charity or you know becoming more careful with shabbat or whatever it is you know whatever whatever it is that we're doing the shem shamaim and we're taking we're we're going on a limb right we don't know how this is going to pan out we have almost no ability to work out the details right so we had this is bitachon comes in very 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 it's very important right here because how do we, we have to, instead of pondering whether we're going to lose from it, whether it's going to, you know, maybe I'm going to risk my relationships or this or that, we have to go all in on Bitachon. And we're going to say, if this is what Hashem wants from me, like we've said so many times, then it's not going to hurt me. Even though in my limited calculations, it might seem that it's going to hurt my friendship, my relationship, right? If I start keeping, I remember when I was younger, right? It becomes it's sometimes it's such, a, such a tough decision to try to start keeping Shabbos when you've been in a culture as a, you know, as a young person, a single person of going out and doing all these things, like you're going to lose all your friendships. You're going to write, you're going to ruin your social life, your life, right? It's like, it sounds silly now as an adult and so many decades later, but these are the real struggles that a person has or keeping kosher, right? How am I going to have my social life? If now I can go to a restaurant, if it's such a big part of my culture and of my social life, right? All these things. So here we apply bitachon. We go all in. It's all. It's all bitachon. It's going all in on Hashem and saying, you know what? If Hashem, if this is what Hashem put in the blueprint for my life, then I have to trust that even though it makes no sense, and even though all my friends are gonna mock me and my coworkers and blah 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 blah, whatever it is, right? I might even lose my job, right? I must trust that it has to be right, right? I don't understand how because the whole world seems to show me that it's not right. But it has to be right. And indeed, of course, it is right, right? So we don't ponder whether we might lose from it or whether it's 100% risk-free. Of course, it's not 100% risk-free that we have all those risks that your 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 mind is telling you about, right? But um, but we do it. For example, if we're inspired to give tzedakah to a certain cause, don't count the dollars. Just trust in Hashem and do good. If you're concerned that the time you devote to learning will hurt your business, take the plunge. Trust in Hashem and do good, right? And those of us who are married and have husbands who maybe are in business and like, oh, instead of stopping our husbands from going to learn, say, go, go and learn, go and pray, go and learn before pray. Like, do what you need to do and you're going to be fine. Like, we have to encourage them and we obviously for ourselves, we're taking this class, we go to classes, we have to take the time also to do these things and not think, oh, if I pray in the morning, it's going to hurt my business, right? I, I, for example, like became like a big, it became a big deal to like, to pray. Let me just let her in to pray, right? And take the time and not be like, oh no, I have to get to these meetings and just, you know, or these emails or whatever it is. So everybody, everybody knows where they are in their level. But the idea being, we have to trust in Hashem as the Pasuk says and do good, right? Okay, so similarly, if your daughter or son would grow by learning in Eretz Israel, don't scour the Israeli news sites for reports on the latest terrorist attack, God forbid, or the latest mass protest, etc., right? So we can't, if we know something is good for our child, right? We don't succumb to the fears of things, you know, when the, here he says, you know, the, there was a time, unless there's a specific dangerous, when the Scud missiles were falling during the Iraq war, trust in Hashem and do good. Even the, at that time, the Lubavitch Rebbe was so emphatic that the Yeshiva Bahram and the girls in seminary should not come home, that they are in the safest place on earth. But going back to a little bit of a less emotionally charged example, I remember I had a friend of mine whose child, um, his 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 rebbe from elementary middle school, uh, from middle uh, yeah from middle school was advising him to go to a particular yeshiva and happens to be that I had experience with that yeshiva so she called me and she said I'm so I want to call you because you know they've been they the rebbe has told us the teacher has told us that our son would be a you know he would do very well in this school what do you think about the school this and that da, 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 da. okay so then we got to the matter of how much does it cost and at that moment. Um, she became very nervous and she said, forget it. She's, I remember vividly. She told me, forget it. There's no way. And I said to her, don't think like that. Don't let the money interfere with what's good for your child. If you know that this is a good yeshiva and you're doing your research, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you, 
if if your Rebbe, if your Rebbe, the Rebbe already told you, the teacher already told you that's the best fit for your child. If you're doing your research and you're finding out that it's the best fit for your child, then go all in because that's what Hashem wants for your child. Don't let the money um, be a hindrance to your child's best store education. And Baruch Hashem, lo and behold, I think the child is already in his third year. So it worked out. It worked out well. But I think it's an important lesson because we make all these calculations, and if it's it's like I said to some 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 ladies in this class, like one time also there was a concern about like um, paying for a wedding or whatever. And I reminded one of our participants, you know, you have to tell Hashem, this is your child, right? I'm not, you don't have to remind Hashem, Hashem knows, but you have to remind yourself, right? That this is Hashem's child. Hashem gave you a mitzvah to educate this child. Hashem gave, in the same way Hashem gave you a mitzvah to marry off this child, then Put it on Hashem. Don't like put it on Hashem. Don't worry. Go all in. Figure out what you need to do and do it com with, com but you have to do it with serenity. That's what we're talking about, right? Going back to the gate of trust, chapter number one. What is the definition of trust? Is the feeling of peace and serenity that comes when you know that the one in whom you trust will come through for me and even go above and beyond. That is the definition as per the gate of trust chapter one, right? That peace of mind and serenity, it's a feeling, right? it's a feeling that comes from the intellect, but it's an emotion. So you going all in means that we do what we need to do without the nervousness and the stress that is hindering us, like really being present in that decision and happy and joyful with that decision, okay? So going back to the idea, the idea here that he's saying is, you trust in Hashem and you do good. You go and you do it. You put the child in the yeshiva. You 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 plan the wedding for your child without the worry and the stress and the lack of sleep and the anger and the despondency and all those negative emotions. Because again, the negative emotions mean there's no bitachon. So this, which which in turn, as we've learned many times in this class, is closing the pipeline, right, of the of the blessing to come down. So with bitachon, it means that we go all in with tranquility and serenity that it's taken care of because my father is the biggest billionaire, trillionaire, right? As we've said many times in this class, he's going to do, he can do anything. So if if my father was the trillionaire, I wouldn't have any any concerns sleeping at night. I wouldn't be calculating anything. I wouldn't be saying, oh, forget the yeshiva. Da, 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 da. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Da, 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 da. Right? All right. None of that. Okay. So with Bitachon, opportunities to grow spiritually, get a green light. I love that visual, right? With Bitachon, any opportunity that I have to grow spiritually or for the spiritual development of my family, they get a green light. That's it. How? I don't have to be involved in the how. The how is up to Hashem. I have to know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it L'Shem Shemaim, and I need to know what I'm doing. I'm doing, I have to know the Torah that I'm following. I have to know what it is that I need to do, right? And have the high, the high, the the right mentors and the right mashpim, the right spiritual guidance. The how, how is it going to come about? That's God's business. He told me what to do. So I have to follow what to do and why I have to do it because I'm here to serve Hashem and make a dwelling place in this world, reveal his God, his, his godliness in this world. Therefore, I just have to do it. How? Hashem's going to figure out. That is his concern. That's his department. That's not our department. As we always say, we work in the efforts department and Hashem works in the results department. So I don't have to worry about the results. I just have to do my little thing, right? And more than the efforts department, we probably should say we work in the bitachon department, right? Instead of putting so much effort and so much um, emphasis on the effort, we should be putting emphasis on our bitachon and minimizing the emphasis on the effort. But meaning Hashem works the, the results department. We don't we don't even have to go to that department. It's off limits for us. It's not our concern. It's not our business, which is, ah, look how nice. I don't even have to be concerned with it. Okay. All right. So now he's going to talk to us about don't make perfect the enemy of good, right? Which we're all familiar with this concept. So the second idea from the Ramban, I think I, I think I said before it was the Rambam, but it's actually the Ramban Nachmanides. So the Ramban's second lesson from this verse is that we can rely on Hashem even if we are not yet worthy. Huh, interesting. If we remember from the gate of trust, from the um, seven qualities of Hashem that we have to know by heart, like we have to really, really know who Hashem is, right? If we remember chapter seven, one of the impediments to trust is not knowing who Hashem is, not knowing who we're trusting. We have to know those seven qualities. So one of those seven qualities is that he is extremely generous to the deserving and the undeserving. So, if a person says, no, I might not deserving, I'm not worth it. It's Baba Mai says, it's nonsense. We have nonsense. We cannot allow that to go into our, um, 
calculations. We have to know that Hashem is is kind. Our bitachon is such can can override whatever else it is. Meaning, like with bitachon, Hashem is just constantly like going to give you because it's just it's just a rule that He is kind to the deserving and the undeserving. We have to we have to work on ourselves not to stop the flow, right? One of the things we have to do is stop thinking that we're not deserving. We have to know that Hashem Hashem has for us and he's happy to give us. As long as we rely on him, everything is good. He's going to come through. Why? Because he's fully reliable. How do I know? Because we already know that he has seven trustworthy qualities that no one in the world has, right? At the same time. So let's review them for a second. Actually, I wasn't going to do that, but let's review them. Number one, he is compassionate. He has compassion, pity, and love for me, right? That's number one. Number two, he's attentive. He is 24-7 attention. He never lifts his eyes off of me, right? Any moment of a constant attention. Number three, he is strong. He's invincible. Nothing can stop him. Number four, he is wise. He has all the wisdom from beginning to end. He knows everything. Number five, he is, he has a solid track record, right? Remember we talked about this way back when, right? He has a solid track record from infant, from my infancy to the end of my life. He's been with me and he knows everything about me. He's Solid, solid track record. Number six, he has absolute sovereignty and jurisdiction over me. No one can harm me or benefit me or do anything to me without without him. Like it's if it's not his will, there is absolutely no one who has sovereignty over me. It's like a master over his servant, right? He, the servant, only the only one who can impact the servant's life is the master. So absolute sovereignty over my life, exclusive sovereignty over my life. And number seven, he is extremely generous to the deserving and the undeserving, right? So those are the qualities that would make any entity that we are going to trust and that we're going to rely on. It's a much better word to say rely than trust. Any entity that we're going to rely on has to have these qualities, right? And we obviously know that nobody has them, not, not you know, and, and they would have, nobody has them, right? No one has, has them but Hashem. Okay, so going back to the text. So here it tells us, we can rely on Hashem even if we are not yet worthy. This is a point we've discussed previously, but it is worth reiterating because so often bitachon flows away from those who worry that they don't deserve Hashem's help, which again, it, go, it, it comes back to bite you because again, it's an impediment to trust. If you don't know the seven qualities of Hashem, one of them is that you don't, that he is extremely generous to deserving and the undeserving. Therefore, why in the world are you worrying and thinking I'm not deserving? Maybe Hashem didn't give me this shit up for my child because I didn't deserve it. Maybe he's not sending me the money because I don't deserve it. It's, it's, it's all nonsense. We can always, always rely on Hashem because the source, capital S, of all mercy will have mercy on us. Wallet number one, he's love, loving kind, right? He's lo He has um, love, pity, and mercy for me. And then quality number seven, he's extremely generous to the serving and undeserving. Okay, as we say in Ashrei, Tov, Tov Hashem Leko. Okay, so I'm going to say it in English. Hashem is good to all. His mercies are on all his works, even if we are not perfect. Even if we are outright sinners, Hashem wants us to trust in him, right? Bitachon applies to everyone. However, our desire to improve has to be sincere, obviously, right? Obviously, one of the five conditions for bitachon to be real bitachon is obedience. So we're all, obviously, we're all sinners. We're all benonim as, as per the Tanya, right? We're we're not, not even benonim. I'm sorry. We're striving to become benonim. We're all rashaim in some way, right? But we have to have a level of obedience. We have to know what we're trying to strive for. And we have to be behaving in that way, attempting to be connect, improve and connect and improve in our relationship and our connect to uh, connection to our creator. Okay. It has to be sincere. We might not be able to fix ourselves immediately. We have a lifetime to do that evidently, right? But our goal must be to do good, right? As David Amelach is telling us in this verse. Okay. So that we're going to, I'm not, I'm going to skip the story and I'm going to go to the end of um, the, the next page 167, where it says, nourish yourself. So here he's going to tell us that this verse is speaking about acquiring Amuna by using the word Urea. No, Urea, sorry. Right. Which literally means and grace. Ask the sheep grace to nourish themselves. Rashi explains that our sustenance is a reward for our emuna. We're literally living off of it, he says. When we give tzedakah, avoid shortcuts in business, do the extra chesed or, or, or add to our learning, we are generating emuna and that is what we end up 
what we graze in the end, right? That will, what we live off of. Because why? Why is he just bringing this up? Because he says in the verse, trust in Hashem and do good, which we already discussed. And the verse ends, dwell in the land and nourish yourself with faithfulness, with Amuna. Okay. So this Amuna says, according to Rashi, is exactly what you end up, it's it's exactly what you get by doing this, by going all in on your in, in trust, right? You're you're at the same time, you're obviously nourishing that belief in Hashem that he's the one who's going to sustain you. And you're you're going on a limb and saying, I'm relying on you. Why? Because I believe in you. I believe in all your qualities. I believe that you're going to sustain me. Right. And and we're going to do the right thing. It's funny that he mentioned Sadaka here because this week's Parsha actually is so much about the Parsha is about Sadaka. But anyway, anyways, anything that we are doing we are literally nourishing our imuna every time that we take a, a, a new step towards um, our connection to Hashem. We're nourishing our imuna, and let's continue here. One last thought on this pasuk comes from the Alter Rebbe Reish Nir Zalman of Liadi, Liadi, who says that we should graze our imuna the way we graze our flocks. Imuna, like sheep, needs to be fed, and it's up to us to feed it. How? by learning, by listening to classes, by thinking and talking about Hashem in our life, as we've said so many times, right? Sharing our stories of divine providence, of divine intervention, of those little wings from above that we have. All these things are literally nourishing our amuna, are nourishing our belief in our creator. And I would say more than that, they're also activating that peace and tranquility, that bitachon, that I'm taking care of, right? And 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 it just helps that nourishing that emuna is what's going to allow me to when something comes up and the tendency is going to be to become self-reliant or reliant on the bank account or reliant on the doctor and whatever it is, I can switch right away and say, no, I'm taken care of. I don't have to try to control the situation. Um, I'm in Hashem's hands because I have seen with my very own eyes how Hashem has come through for me all of my life, right? So that emuna, that, that belief that's created by all these um these instances where we feed it by learning Torah, by sharing ideas, by sharing experiences, all that are going to help us in our development of that peace and of mind and tranquility, i.e. that bitachon, okay? Um, when we focus on Amuna, we see it more clearly and it becomes stronger, strong enough to carry us through whatever life brings. All right, so let's do the recap of the chapter. He says, David Melech didn't see the fruits of his labor right away. But he taught us to trust in Hashem and do good even while we wait. The Rambam tells us to trust in Hashem to help, help us succeed when we undertake something in our avodas Hashem. We should not fear the inherent risks, financial or otherwise. He also says that we can trust in Hashem even if we are not doing the right thing as long as our sincere intention is to do good. So we have to have bitachon as even when we're still working on ourselves and we have, you know, even if you're not there in whatever it is, your prayer or your, you know, your observance of Shabbat or your whatever, or so, you know, the way you speak or whatever, even if you're not at the place you want to be, you're working towards it. That's not that. That's not. Don't hold yourself back from saying, OK, I, I can't rely on Hashem. Like this is not a level for me. No, no, this is a level for everyone. Everyone should be working on their bitachon. Why? Because bitachon is at the core of the, the, at the end of the day, bitachon is about the relationship, right? And yes, the relationship involves many details, right? And we have to strive our best to do and to, to um, incorporate those details in, in our life. But the relationship is there for the taking. And we have to literally um, attach ourselves to him, which is what we said so many times that bitachon and the, the word tach is part of bitachon and tach means a cementing, right? A cementing of two entities right the one who trusts in the one he is trusting our amuna sustains us rather than impinging on our parnasa on our livelihood our efforts in avodas hashem and serving hashem create our livelihood amuna needs to be fed when you're trying to balance parnasa efforts livelihood efforts with avodas hashem with serving hashem try switching the calculation and thinking Serving Hashem can only help my Parnassah. This is so good, right? Serving Hashem can, oh, it's never going to hurt you. It's its its a its a fallacy of the wor world that it's going to hurt you. It can only help you. So don't make calculations and go all in. And that is an, an application of, a full application of Bitachon. Um, 
I want to do chapter 46 now, but before we started, I'm going to share a um, funny story. I was, we were going on this vacation. This is the story I want to tell you that I told you to remind me at the end, but I'll say it now. We were going on this, um, we we're going to go visit my mother and we were planning this trip. And at first I said, okay, we have to go on this trip when the kids are out of town. It's going to be better. It's going to be more economical. And um, like we're going to anyway have like two weeks window of time where we can go. And I, I needed to go. There was no way I couldn't go. I needed to go. Well, whatever it was, we missed the boat on the tickets. It was whatever it was. It was way out of our budget. And we just couldn't do it at the time. And also, like, my husband was busy with something. Whatever it is, there were, like, too many things that happened. But a part of me, I have to be honest, I was, I, I'd had those moments of despondency of, like, oh, you know, like, like we missed our boat. Like, we should have planned this earlier. And we all, we knew when the kids were going to be out of town. And why did we wait so long? You know, like, I wasn't accepting it the way I should, we should be accepting things as they are right now. Right. Um, I was trying, I was working on it, but I, if I'm honest, there were, there were those moments of like, oh, come on. Right. Um, so it ended up being that even though it, the summer kept getting a little bit more into the summer and we were going to have at the time one child home, we decided to look into tickets again, because again, it was too important that I go see my mother for many, many reasons. And, and we found something that, wow, was like so, so good. And we said, yeah, let's take it. So we took it. And we were going to be three of us. And then one of our kids decided that he was going to come from from camp and he was not going to stay the second month. And now we're like, oh, my goodness, like we have to fight a fourth ticket. And in the end, so two things. So number one, in the end, it was so beautiful to have two for my mother to have two grandchildren. And not only that, for the kids to be together, they had so much fun together. They kept each other company. It was like beautiful and amazing. But so that was all fine. But within that, then came the where do we stay? Right. Because we don't all fit in my mother's house. So it was like, where do and, and also the cashers of this, that, whatever. OK, so now we start with the Airbnb and the da, 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 right. And of course, again, I find the quote unquote perfect place. And then I say, no, but I'm going to wait till my husband and this and that. And then by the time we finish the conversation and we finish analyzing every alternative of Airbnb to get to the conclusion that I yeah, L already discovered, you know, two days ago that it was the perfect Airbnb. By the time we got to that conclusion together, then, of course, we had lost the Airbnb. Right. And of course, again, you, you're like, ah, you know, if we had done it two days ago, da, 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 it was the perfect thing. And my husband, like, and someone else was like, hello, don't you think that if it's the perfect Airbnb, we would be having the perfect Airbnb right now? Obviously, it's not what Hashem has in store. If it's not happening, just like the tickets didn't happen when we thought was the perfect time. If it's not happening, it's because obviously there's something much better in store. Well, to tell you a long story short, we ended up saying super close to my mother at a place that we never imagined a hotel that we'd be able to go to don't like it, it ended up being like the most perfect place really next to the new kosher restaurant 10 minute walk from my mother's house i mean it couldn't be like private beach it couldn't have been better right and it's like why do we get so frustrated obviously these are you know easy problems like this is not even a real problem i acknowledge it but it's just to show the example, right? Obviously, there are much bigger challenges in life where it's so much harder to accept what is, but it just shows the example that we are so habituated to just resist and get frustrated. And, and it's, it's, it's less common for us to drop into that place of, oh, everything is good. It must be good. It is. It is exactly what needs to be. And what the outcome is there. It's at the, it, I just, I'm going to turn the corner and see the outcome. I don't see it now. Right. But it's right there. Right. And I anticipate it with joy and with happiness because I know it has to be amazing and it has to be good. Right. And it's almost like if we could train ourselves to not fall into that despondency and say, wow, I know there must be something really, really good coming. And I'm already, like we discussed a few weeks ago in the last class, I'm already in that state of expectation and, and, and joy of having that outcome. And let me tell you, because like we see it so many times in our lives um, and and we we have to fight the cynic within us. I think there's the, the, there's a lot of that. And again, I, I know that there's so many bigger problems that we can all have, but I'm just sharing this little example to just to show how, like, like we all fall into this, like, you know, like my friend Margie says, we said the other day, like, anytime we get desperate, 
it's 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 we ne we should never get desperate. Any time that a person gets desperate, it's a recipe for disaster. And you can just have to look in the Torah. Any time the Jews got desperate, it was a disaster, right? So in life, we cannot get desperate. You can't get desperate. I get a separate as we say in Espanol in Spanish, right? You have to, you have to be with 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 this. You have to go with the flow. And with going with the flow, he's going to talk about this in chapter forty six. So let's move to chat. Jump over to chapter forty six. Sunrise, sunset. Okay. Here the Pasuk is Tehillim 37 6. He will bring forth your righteousness like a light and your justice like high noon. How does Hashem bring forth light? Elsewhere in Tehillim, David Amelech describes the sunrise. My soul yearns for, for the Lord among those longing for the dawn, those longing for the dawn. Okay, so my soul is yearning for Hashem. Um, how? Um, among those who are longing for the dawn, and he repeats again, those longing for the dawn. Okay, so now the light of dawn is coming. We all know that, right? This is absolutely certain. And the night watchman strains his eyes over the horizon to see its first glimmer, which will end his long uh, vigil. At no point does he turn away from the eastern sky in despair and saying, it's never going to come. Like, did you ever see a watchman saying, oh, forget about it. Like, like we're doomed. It's never coming. No, it's, it's so certain that it's coming. And that's what ends his night shift. Like, it's like he doesn't get frustrated. He doesn't get desesperado. He doesn't get desperate. Again, it's the worst thing that a person can do. He doesn't get desperate because he knows it's coming. Okay. So in this verse, this verse we're discussing uh, in, th in this verse that we're discussing in this lesson, the sun plays two roles. First, Hashem brings it forth in the morning, which is connected to righteousness, right? It says he will bring forth your righteousness like a light, right? So the right rays of the sun come in the morning. Uh, that's connected to righteousness. And then the sun reaches its harshest, brightest point, high noon, which is connected to justice. Because the verse says, and your justice like high noon. So again, he will bring forth your righteousness like a light and your justice like high noon. Okay, so now we have two. We have the sun, the sun of the dawn, right? The sun comes forth in the morning and we have the sun in the middle of the day. It's harshest. In the morning, the sun emerges gradually, right? If you ever saw, I, I was in Florida not so long ago. I, actually, I'm my friend Margie that I just mentioned. We decided that we were going to, we're going to pray right when the sun breaks and it was at the beach we were in florida and we like got up really early and we went out to the ocean and we started our prayers and by the time that was exact point of sunrise we said shmona esther it was a, it's a so it was so beautiful it was so so beautiful right but you see the process of how it's happening and it's like whoa like it's 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 like a slow gradual process and then wow boom there's the sun it's actually it's actually it's actually something I I actually even though I grew up by the water and I probably had I don't know hundreds thousands of opportunities to notice this and and we used to go boating and all sorts of things I'm sure I've experienced it but I never had actually experienced it meaning consciously consciously like literally been there watching the sunrise. It was something spectacular, okay? So it sheds light in the darkness and warms up the chilly air. It starts a new day, bringing hope and energy. This is the way Hashem's kindness emerges. When we're lying in bed in the middle of the night, our minds occupied with worries, we can take comfort in knowing that things will look better in the morning, right? And we can be in the, in the middle of the night and it's like, we. I always remind myself and others, like, Hashem doesn't go to sleep. So you can go to sleep because he he has the package taken care of and he's not going to sleep. Remember that third quality? He's attentive. Wait, third? No, second quality. He's attentive 24 seven. He's not going anywhere. You go to sleep because he didn't go to sleep. He can he can take care of your problems while you're sleeping. OK, so I'm going back to the sunlight. So Hashem's kindness is slowly emerging just like the sunrise. OK. In the morning, things are going to be better. Okay, so that's the first idea. Now, noontime, the sun is different by then. It is harsh, like the light of judgment that exposes our flaws, our, our imperfections, and drives us to do teshuva. 
The noon sun makes us uncomfortable. As Hashem makes us uncomfortable in times of judgment, right? It's not always, it doesn't always feel pleasant. There's not, it, sometimes it's like, mm, right? Like we're talking about the resistance, the frustration, right? It, like Hashem is holding something back for a te temporarily, granted, it's, we know it's temporarily, but it's a, it's a moment of din, of judgment, of Hashem holding something back. Why? To compel us to take a good look at ourselves and change what needs to be changed. And this is probably the hardest thing for anybody, right? For for all of us to actually, when we're in a, a, a moment of divine like constriction, where there's like a moment of the harsh sun, now we know there's like, like divine judgment to actually look inwards and reflect on what do I need to change? Where do I need to get out of my comfort zone? Where do I need to stretch myself spiritually, um, mentally, emotionally, because it's all, it's all in me. It's so much harder than being blaming, um, playing victim, pointing fingers. It's my mother-in-law. It's the school. It's the principal. It's my husband. It's my parents-in-law. It's my parents. It's my trauma from childhood. It's my childhood teacher. It's my ex-husband. It's like, right, all these things. It's so much easier, but so often in life, if not always in life, the answer really lies within us. And that is, so, it's it's hard work. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's hard work. And But it's always the solution. It, the looking inwards is always the solution. So again, Hashem very often makes us uncomfortable because there's something within us that we need to develop. There's a potential that needs to be maximized and exposed. And only with a little bit of harshness, right? Like the olive needs to be squeezed. Is it going to come out? So there's also a hope in the noon sun because we know that this is at its peak, that this is its peak. Its harsh rays will gradually soften. So that's the point here that, yes, we might feel like it's so harsh, but we also have we also know, just like the watchman we said at the beginning, knows that the sun is going to break in the morning. It's not going anywhere. It's going to come up. Right. Also, the noon, the, the the high point of the sun at noon, we know eventually is going to soften and it's going to eventually disappear. Just as sunset is programmed into the day, an end to our troubles is programmed into Hashem's plans. It's like we said, we always said Hashem already created the solution. So we have a choice. We can live in the problem or we can live in the solution because the solution already exists. It's, it's you just have to turn the corner and it's right there and i know it's like what are you kidding me well if, after you've learned bitachon long enough like you've strengthened this muscle long enough you're like yeah, yeah it's actually right around the corner right i could choose to live in that space right there where the solution is or i can be in the place of the problem and honestly it's a it's a much better way of life to live in the state of mind of the solution okay but the solution exists if there is a problem just like there's high sun it means there's also sunset like it's going to go down, right? The solution exists and I could have, I have a choice. Do I want to, do I want to live in that mindset of, oh, this is all there is, only the harsh sun, that's all? Or, oh no, there's a solution, right? It's it's right there. It's happening. Just like, just like always the sun is going to, um, there's going to be a sunset. Therefore, this verse fortifies our bitachon from two opposite ends of the spectrum. We can wait for the sunrise like the night watchman, knowing with absolute certainty that our salvation will definitely emerge bit by bit over the horizon, right? He doesn't give up. He doesn't become despondent. He knows it's coming. What's the big deal already? He does his job every day. He knows at some point the sun's going to rise and he's going to end his, like, it, it's not even, so we have to approach it like that. On the other hand, when we're in the midst of challenges, we can also take comfort in knowing that the challenges, like the noon sun, will surely sink into the sky and set. So I think it's a beautiful, beautiful message. According to the Alshish, the, the Alshish, the two parts of the Pasuk work together. This is because Hashem's justice works to bring out our righteousness. Every Jewish person is rooted in holiness, as it says in the, the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, every Jewish person has a chelik elokam imam, mamash, like literally a piece of God above, right? And the fact that he sins is only an external stain that sticks to him. But his insides are good. Like, there's, it's, it's untainted. He's a gem. He's a diamond. It's just it's a little, like, there's schmutz there to be clean, right? And it's funny because we're approaching already Elul. It's going to be Shabbos Mubarakim. We're going to bless the month of Elul. So we're getting in this spirit already of knowing, oh, you know what? There's things I need to correct, right? But at my essence, by the time I get to Yom Kippur, I understand, you know what? Everything that I, I, I can work on all this. But at my core... 
I am completely connected to Hashem. And when I get to that point, the highest point in the davening and Yom Kippur and Neila, I know that like, like I am completely, completely connected one with Hashem. I'm peace of Hashem. Yes, I have things that I'm working on and I have to work on and that's why I'm here and I'm praying and I'm doing all these things and I'm fasting and, da, 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 and I've worked throughout Elul and I work, but, but, but at a core, every Jew is a precious, you know, like the Rebbe taught us, right? An only child born to parents at their old age. And he, and the Rebbe says that's only because we don't have any words to really express the love that Hashem has for us. Like that's not even really doesn't even begin to describe it, but it's an idea of how much the love of Hashem could be for us. Like a parent loves an, their only child that was born to them in their old age. Okay. But going back to the test. So the challenge, so the fact that we have, we have stuff, it's only just like stuff, you know, we need to get a little laundry, just like a piece of garment sometimes gets schmutz and you have to sink to laundry. Of course, we have to launder ourselves. We have to do that. No, no question. Okay. But we should not think I'm a worthless piece of nothing. I'm not, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? You're not allowed to say that you're a piece of Hashem. You're a, you're a godly soul. You're a diamond. You're a, you're a child of Hashem. The challenges that Hashem imposes through his attribute of justice can clear away the sin, the stain, sorry, the stain, leaving the righteousness to emerge in full force, right? Those challenges very often are well, like, like the olive that gets pressed to get the precious, the the the, the best um, olive oil, right? Sometimes Hashem has to put a little, a little uh, judgment so that our potential comes out, okay? The emunah and bitachon with which we face a challenge are the proof of this righteousness, right? And that's when we, so very often we see, I saw, oh my gosh, I saw, I went to, I was in the JLI retreat a couple of weeks ago and Sapir Cohen, she's a young woman who was taken um, hostage by Hamas for 55 days. She was in captivity. And when you hear her speak is exactly the true example of this, of this, um, of this, line that he that I just read the emuna and bitachon with which we face a challenge are the proof of this righteousness the the level of emuna and the level of um the bitachon that you see in the way she spoke and the way she faced the horrendous challenge challenging situation lo aleinu, we should never know of it and our hostages should come back immediately and we should hear only good news it's been way too long and we've been praying for this too long and it's 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 high time that hashem delivered on his promise to take care of us in a revealed way may it happen right now um but the way that we that i saw that girl how the challenge like changed her and she the way she expressed it how she 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 said at the beginning there was this level of despondency of why is this happening to me and then she said and suddenly i just made a switch and the minute i made a mental switch that i wasn't i wasn't i'm not i haven't been taken i was sent here she said i was sent here for something there is no way that i'm here for nothing there is a reason why i'm here she says I felt so empowered. Suddenly I became calm. I focused on why I needed to be here. And there was a younger girl with her, a 16 year old girl. And she said, I made it my mission to make this girl happy and to make her feel calm. And everything I would do was, and she became, she became this giver. And she's she, one of the terrorists is like, why, why are you like, why is it that you, everything about you is light, right? Be she became a joker. She would tease these horrible people that had the four men that had her hostage don't ask she make crack jokes she like teased with her brain you said Yiddish a cup and about they, they weren't feeding her whatever crazy stories she would play with them and she would make the other girl laugh and make her happy and she literally she but the point being that she changed to like she she said like she she felt empowered she said i'm not a victim of this situation if god put me in this situation there's a reason for it and when you hear it in a person who's gone uh, gone through such a horrible situation, you see, wow, what a level of amun and bitachon to, to, to know I must be here for a reason. The creator of the world didn't just send me here for nothing. There is something I need to accomplish. And I trust that I'm here for something and I'm going to fulfill it. Um, and it came from that challenge. So continuing inside the book. 
In a speech to the Deal New Jersey community, Rav David Grossman from Migdal Haemek said, I never met an irreligious Jew. It is just hiding inside. Okay, so whatever suffering a person is experiencing, God forbid nobody should know of it, and everybody who needs a refua and a healing should be healed, our hostages should be back, everybody who needs a shidduch should have the shidduch, everybody who needs parnasa, nobody should be suffering. Okay, but if there is a suffering and there's a discomfort, right? It's, it is meant to bring out the hidden righteousness, the light waiting just below the horizon to shine forth. As the Rishon Rav Yosef Ibn Yahya reiterates, your salvation will be for sure like the morning sun rising. The negativity as well will go for sure away like the sun setting in the afternoon. And this we have to know for certain, like the watchman knows it. The watchman knows that the sun is going to rise, right? And we all know that also the noon heat is going to pass. And Sherry, the Texas summer heat is also going to pass. I don't know how, when, but we know it does. So, right, <laughs> I have no control over it, but we have to know it's going to pass. When I, I thought of you, when I was in Puerto Rico, I was like this, this Caribbean ocean breeze. I mean, there's nothing like this. Like, please, Hashem, what a, what a gift. Like, this is just like, thank you, Hashem, for this weather. It's not normal. I came back to Texas. So I'm like, OMG. Okay. The question is, will we wait it out, right? That's such a, are we going to wait it out or are we going to lose our bitachon before the inevitable salvation comes? That That's really the story, the whole story of our life. Are we going to get impatient and lose our bitachon when the solution is right at the turn of the corner, right? And many of us are like that. We just can't handle the waiting. We cannot handle the waiting. Right. And here he gives us a great story that I remember sharing. And I think I shared it recently at the Shabbos table, or even maybe it was a Pesach that I shared it because it's a Pesach story. But it's a story of two beggars. And one is a Jewish beggar and one is a non Jewish beggar. Um, and so there was the came the night of the Pesach Seder. And the Jewish beggar tells the non Jew a great tip. He tells them, you know, tonight is our night. Tonight is the Jewish night. You can go to any Jewish home. And they're going to welcome you and they're going to give you a fabulous, wonderful meal, right? And so the non-Jewish uh, beggar is so happy and excited that the Jew tipped him off, right? And they both went their separate ways. And after the night, like at 1, 2 a.m., whatever it was, they met again. The Jewish beggar was so happy, he had a full stomach. He was happy as can be. He, he lay down on his bench. He fell asleep. When the non-Jewish beggar saw him like laying down comfortably, he got so angry and he yelled and he cursed at him. He woke him up and the, the Jewish guy says, what happened to you? Why are you, why are you, why are you screaming? What's wrong with you? Right. And the non-Jewish beggar says, I'm going to tell you what happened. This is crazy. It's nothing like you told me. You told me they're going to take care of me. This was crazy. I went to a Jewish house just like you told me. And yes, they did invite me in and they sat me down. But what did they give me? They gave me a glass of wine on an empty stomach. And it felt like fire going down. And I waited a while and they mumbled a bunch of strange words. And then we washed our hands to eat and they give me a little piece of celery, a little tiny vegetable. I gobbled down the whole thing I was so hungry and then there was a long stretch again of mumbling strange words and we washed our hands again and they gave me a small piece of hard burnt unleavened bread anybody who eats shmura matzah like sherry and I knows what he's talking about right no. and then they gave me this horse radish this spicy stuff it's crazy I took a bite and I started choking I said enough is enough I'm out of here and I just stormed out of that place and the Jewish beggar says, what? You got up and you left? Are you crazy? If you would have waited just a few more minutes, you would have been served a whole delicious meal with soup and meat and potatoes and vegetables and tea and cake and sorbet and everything you can imagine. You crazy, right? So it's, it's a great story to understand. It's the same thing. We just don't wait and we walk away halfway through the process we lose our bitachon halfway through the process because we want to make it our timing and we don't understand that Hashem has this timing and the beautiful meal at the Seder is going to come you're not just going to eat horseradish and stale 
hard, crunchy bread and who knows what, okay? So many people make this same mistake. We hold on to our bitachon, hoping and trusting Hashem. And then finally, we decide it's not working. I'm done with this, right? We give up before the sun sets on our challenge when we forget that it's a guarantee. It's literally a guarantee. Bitachon is a guarantee. He is going to come through for you. and There's no choice. If we can only hold on to our bitachon until the inevitable resolution, our challenge will bring forth our righteousness and enable us to bask in the gentle rays of sunshine, of sunrise. Sorry. Okay, so Hashem's righteousness is like a sunrise. We can wait for it with full certainty that it will come even when we don't see it yet. The noon sun is like Hashem's justice. It is harsh, but it is on the way down. If we hold on to our bitachon, we will see that our problems eventually dissipate. A person's challenges are meant to move him towards teshuva, right? Return to himself, return to his essence, right? So that his inherent holiness and righteousness can emerge like the morning sun regarding a difficulty in your life ask yourself if you would be able to bear it more calmly if you knew when it was going to be over now tell yourself Hashem has already scheduled the end of this challenge it's it's coded right it's coded it, it, it is scheduled already I may not may not know the date but it exists so that is, I'm going to actually, I was going to do chapter 47, but I'm going to end it here. And um, any questions or any comments?